And so I'm so excited to open God's word with you this morning uh, because we're starting this new series. And I believe that it is more than a series. It is more like a campaign. My prayer is that we're going to be talking about uh, this topic in every home, in every hallway, in all of our community groups, and that it is even going to impact your personal time with the Lord, uh, that you'd be asking him to move you into a deeper and a stronger commitment to what he is calling you into this year. So this morning, we're going to be in Revelation 1. You can start making your way there now. And, And one of the themes in Revelation is the reality that God desires every tribe, tongue, and nation to be before his throne worshiping. You know, here at Kingsland, we've been going to the nations for years. And over the last several years, uh, the nations have been coming uh, to Kingsland. And so as we kick off this, uh, this series, I've invited my friend, Miss T.T. Davies, to come up and actually read our passage for us Uh, this morning. Give her a big Kingsland welcome. (laughs) Miss Davies has been coming to North Katy for a little while now. Uh, She's from Nigeria, and and I love how we got connected. You may not remember this. She had not the best experience at Kingsland North Katy. And I get these emails from time to time from people who are like, I really had a bad experience. I'm never coming back. And I apologize, and I, I, I hate that. And we go to great lengths to try and meet every family, every person right where they're at. But Miss Davies had a bad experience. And she sent me an email. She said, I had a bad experience and I want to fix it. And I said, we're going to be friends. (laughs) And so we're so thankful for you and your family uh, that come and and support uh, what we have going on here. And so uh, you're going to be reading to us in your native language, which is, I can't say it. Yoruba. Yoruba. From Nigeria. And it, it's going to give you goosebumps. So if you don't speak that language, we're going to have the verses on the screen uh, behind, behind us. So thank you so much for reading this morning. Thank you. I read from Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. I read in Yoruba, in Nigerian language. If he haunt, he jesu Christi, ti olorun fi fun. Lati fi haunt fun, a wan ron shere. On ti kole shay she, ni lolo. O si ron she. O si fi hon, la ti yon wò angel i re foun, jo anu, i ron she re. E ni ti yon jeri yon bo bo ti yon ri, e yi ni oro loron, a ti yon ri, ti Jesu Christi. E ni bukun, ni e ni tinka, a ti yon wò ti yon bò oro i sotele yi, ti yon si yon pan, yon kon wò yi mò. Ni to ri, i gba kou si dede. Verse 4. Jo anu, si yon wò, I jomeje ti mbe ni ejia. Ori o fe fun yi a ti alafia. La ti o do eni ti o mbe. Ti o si ti wa. Ti o si mbo wa. A ti la ti o do a wwa emi meje ti mbe wa ni wadju i tere. A ti la ti o do Jesu Christi. Ele ri o ti to. A kobi ni no a wwa oku. A ti alashe a wwa oba ye. Eni ti o fe wa. Eni ti o gba wa kuro lo wwa eshe. Nikpa e jere. Ti o si fi wa je oba ati alufa lati si olorun ati babare. Ti re ni ugo ati ijoba lai ati lai lai ami. Verse 7. Ki e si, ombo ni no awo somo, bobo ju ni yosiri ati awonto gun ni okokbelu ati bobo orile ide aye ni yoma bonrere e kon ni tori re. Be ni no, a mi. E mi ni alfa ati omega ni oluwa olorun wi. E ni ti o mbe, ti o ti wa, ti o si mbo wa, alagbara. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you so much. I love that. It gets me every time. It's so good that we can open God's word together. What a way to start 2022. So before we jump into the reminders that we see in our text for today, I just want to touch on the book of Revelation kind of at that that large level for just a moment. 
You know, Revelation, it can be a very daunting, a very scary book uh, for, for people to jump into. It's got vibrant descriptions of angels, of animals, of the throne of God, of this sea of glass. Scholars have disagreed about uh, many things in, in the book of Revelation. Is it literal? Is it figurative? Is it happening now? Has it already happened? They've disagreed for generations. In fact, John Calvin who is one of the greatest minds of the Reformation era, he wrote a commentary on every book in the Bible except one. Any guesses? He didn't touch the book of Revelation. I'm sure he touched the book of Revelation. He didn't write us a commentary on the book of Revelation. But despite the challenges, despite the disagreement, it is vital for us as believers that we study this book. It is holy, it is inspired scripture that tells us more about the God who loves us, who created us, and wants a deeper relationship with each one of us. You see, we can't be afraid of biblical prophecy. Did you know that one out of every five verses in scripture has something to do with biblical prophecy? It is filling the pages of our scripture. You see, God wants us to be aware of how our current times intersect and interact with the ancient texts. He also wants us to know what to expect, what is to come. And so unfortunately, many people, as they think about prophecy, they fall into one of two ditches, either sensationalism or skepticism. Sensationalists are, are people who think that everything they see everywhere is a sign. It's that person, and, and you probably know one or two of them, that if they see three sixes in a 12-digit in a phone number, they think that they are dialing Satan directly. And that may be a little bit of an over-exaggeration, but you get the idea. Skeptics, on the other hand, tend to think that since some of these things that are talked about have not happened yet, things like um, Christ's return, that the, the physical, literal return must not be true. You see, the Bible actually addresses that in 2 Peter 3. He says this, above all, be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing and following their own evil desires, saying, where is his coming? Where is his coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. You see, for believers, we must approach the word of God with humility and with an earnest desire to hear from the Lord. To lean one way or the other isn't to be more liberal or more conservative. You see, there are great minds, theologians, scholars, pastors for generations that have a healthy view of God and the inspiration of Scripture that are at odds over these things. The big picture that we all have to keep in mind when we study this book is that Jesus is coming back. And in the end, he wins. Precisely how that happens, uh, we're gonna do our best to study, to learn, uh, and, and to teach, but we already know the ending of the story. And so as we begin today, let's look at just how John got this divine inspiration. Revelation 1, starting in verse 1, it says this, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. The word revelation it's used for the title of the book as well, and what John is writing right there uh, is the Greek word ap apocalypsis. Any guess at the English word that we get from that? Of course, it's apocalypse. But the meaning isn't what you might think. That word actually means laying bare, a disclosure of truth, an uncovering or an unveiling. You see, Revelation was written to disclose truth, to unveil what to expect, to, to uncover what is to come. John received these words from an angel and, and as we're going to see, from a vision that God gave him. So let's take a look at a couple of the reminders from Revelation that are important to us as individuals and to Kingsland as a church right now. 
The first reminder that we get from our text is the urgency of the mission. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. You know, some of you may be thinking this was written over 2,000 years ago and it hasn't happened yet. So isn't this proven wrong? Well, if we dig back into the, the Greek a little bit, and I apologize if there are linguists in here, I'm butchering the Greek language. Um, but this word for soon that is used here is, is tachos. And it actually means a short period of time. And it's clear that, that there is imminence, that John is riding with an impeding uh, event that is going to happen. Even in verse three, God tells us that the time is near. But we have to remember that this word soon is a relative term and it has to be judged in light of the whole scripture. Which, just a side note, the best way for you to do Bible study on tough passages is to interpret your text with other scripture. That's the best place that you can ever start is letting God's word interpret God's word. And so to understand what this word soon uh, could mean for us, let's flip over to 2 Peter. You don't have to flip. It's going to be on the screen. 2 Peter uh, 3, verse 8, he says, Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. In Matthew 24, it says, therefore, be alert since you don't know what day your Lord is coming. But know this, if the homeowner had known what time the thief was coming, he would have stayed alert and not let his house be broken into. This is why you are also to be ready because the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And just consider this. If at the end of the first century, the apostle John is writing about the impending return of Jesus Christ, how much more urgent should that be for us in 2022? You see, so many of the prophecies that are to take place before Jesus returns have already happened. In fact, Pastor Rush is gonna preach to us next week uh, we're calling it a panorama of prophecies. He's gonna be touching on some of the major prophecies that we are expecting and some that we have seen uh, fulfilled. And so you won't wanna miss that uh, next week. But at the end of the book of Revelation, if we look at chapter 22, verse seven, Jesus declares to us, he says, look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps these words of prophecies of this book. A few verses later in verse 12, he says, look, I am coming soon and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. That's why we've called uh, this series Coming Soon. I believe, and, and most of you uh, can sense this with me, that there is an incredible urgency to our mission right now. That it's just different right now than it has been in the last few years, especially if you look back even 10 years ago. This urgency should be driving us deeper into the mission that God has laid on our hearts as a church. And so as we continue to look at Revelation over the next few weeks, I hope that we are called to live differently, to love differently, to act differently, uh, but that this is gonna impact not just the next few weeks while we're in this series, but our entire year and beyond. But we do have some special emphasis, a, a, a recalling to our vision as a church uh, that we are gonna be focusing on uh, over the next uh, little bit. And so we get the privilege this morning to hear just a few moments uh, from our senior pastor, Ryan Rush, uh, about what to expect over the next few weeks in this year. And so would you turn your attention to the screen? Hey, church family, thanks for allowing me to take a moment in the midst of the sermon today to share some burdens that are on my heart. I've been praying about for the last few months and I think are going to be central to our church life in the months ahead. And I'm asking you to pray with me about these. We've entitled this series Coming Soon in part because that's straight out of the book of Revelation, but also in part because we recognize that some very significant opportunities are coming soon as well. And so 
I enter this year with three specific goals I'm asking for you to share with me, all right? The first of those goals is to recognize the urgency of this moment. You can probably feel that just like I can. There's an urgency to our ministry right now. There's a critical point of opportunity that God has given us. Where does that come from? What's coming soon? Well, first of all, Jesus Christ is coming soon. Does that mean that he's coming tomorrow? We don't know. Christ may not come back for another 300 years, but we know that Christ's return is imminent, even if it's not immediate. And we're supposed to look for that soon return. And if Christ tarries, I'll tell you what else is urgent regardless. I'll tell you what's coming soon. There is a contrast with the culture. You could call it culture wars, but I don't know that we need to, to talk about it in the midst of, in a, in a way of thinking about conflict. But think about the fact that there is a distinct contrast between what the Bible teaches and what we see around us every day that seems to be accelerating. In other words, some neighbors who used to look at the church as just irrelevant might even look at the church now as the enemy because truth is supposed to be relative. You'll be able to do whatever you want to do and, and act on whatever you feel rather than look at any objective truth that's universal that we see in the word of God. So there is an urgency as far as cultural contrast. And I'll tell you another way, there is an urgency. There's an urgency about the younger generations among us. Many would contend that we're losing a generation spiritually right now. Now, I am deeply grateful for the younger generations among us at Kingsland, those who are 25 and younger among us in our student ministries and below, because you're passionate about the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a, a contrasting light that's shining for Jesus Christ, and I praise God for you. But we want to see that multiplied in important ways, and we want to make sure that we're equipping our younger generations in powerful ways for this urgent time. So the first goal of this focus, this campaign at Kingsland, is to recognize the urgency. The second goal is to reset the vision. When I talk about the vision at Kingsland, something that we've been praying about for about six years is that God would allow us to see 10,000 homes transformed by the power of the gospel in the next 10 years. Now, as we prayed through that, we've gotten closer to that date in 2025 where we'd celebrate 10,000 homes. But when we recognize the urgency, I think we all see God has given us an amazing platform as a congregation to see homes transformed. And in fact, we're ready to look at that number now and celebrate where we are and recalibrate that number. And so on Sunday, February 13th, we're going to have a great celebration Sunday on all of our campuses where we unveil the number of homes that we can estimate have been transformed to this point. And I'm so excited to tell you, we have been crunching the numbers and looking so that we can give a substantive answer to you. So we'll celebrate that number together where we are. And then as we pray through this, by God's grace, we're gonna reset that vision in light of the urgency that we see now of asking the Lord that we could see many more homes transformed by the power of the gospel in our lifetimes. And so we'll be sharing that in the days ahead. We want to recognize the urgency, that's the first goal. Second, we want to reset the vision. And third, we want to recommit to the mission God has put before us. God has given us a glorious mission here at Kingsland, inviting all people to experience true fulfillment in Jesus Christ, one home at a time. And it's a wonderful mission that we're seeing lived out, but we wanna make sure individual, heart to heart, house to house, it's making a change in your life and my life in some substantive ways. And we want to understand how we can recommit to that mission in light of the urgency of this moment and what God is doing. And so I want to share, you, share with you four specific ways I'm praying that God would help us to recommit to that mission in the coming days. In order to do that, I want to use an acrostic and I'm going to use the word leap. We're leaping into the future. Yes, I'm just corny enough to use an acrostic in order to help me remember and maybe it'll help you remember. That L stands for live the habits. We talk all the time about the habits of resting, blessing, gathering, and going. And listen, if we were conducting a stewardship campaign, some of you who have been around church for a while know that a lot of times what we do is try to stretch one another's faith by saying, let's take that next step of faith, however you're giving, give a little bit more, what have you, and we trust the Lord in that way, that's wonderful. But I want us to do the same thing with regard to our vision and mission. 
And I want to ask you to look at your own life and your own habits and ask the Lord, Lord, how can I stretch my faith in these four areas in my life and my household in the coming year? We're going to share a lot of nuts and bolts to that in the days ahead, but I'm asking you to start thinking about it now. Living the habits in the coming year. The E stands for engaging our men. I'm praying that God would help us to engage our men in our church at another level. Now listen, ladies, don't tune me out and think I'm being isolating and alienating to you. No, I think we can all agree that there's something significant in scripture about the servant leadership of the man. And there's nothing more healthy than servant leadership in a church of, of men who will step up by serving. Now, we have so messed up what power means when we look at this in, in, uh, in light of our culture. So don't, don't think of it in that way. Think of what it means biblically for a man to give everything, for a man to go first, to a, for a man to serve first. And here's what I found. Around Kingsland, God has blessed us with an extraordinary army of mighty men who love the Lord Jesus and who care deeply and serve the church. Well, what I found both in conversations and in our research is that when it comes to connecting church and home life and seeing the parents as the primary faith trainers, the ladies in our church have taken most of the leadership in that regard. And guys, I'm going to call us to a different level of commitment this year. In fact, I want to do something right now that I have not done in my nearly eight years as your pastor. I'm calling an urgent meeting of all men on Thursday evening, January the 20th at the Central Campus Worship Center. We'll all gather together. And listen, we're not going to have any barbecue as much as I love barbecue. We don't have a concert or a guest speaker. You have me. And I want to share some very specific things that are on my heart for the men of our church as I pray toward our future. And I'm asking you right now to clear your calendar and be with us. I'm asking as we recommit to the mission in this year that we would live the habits in a new way, that we would engage the men the third priority that is that letter A is that we would advance our financial goals. Listen, I'm so grateful for a, a strong fiscal plan here at Kingsland. Great leadership and our finance ministry team and our business office. And so we're in a healthy place. But when we recognize the urgency that we have before us, I'm asking that the Lord would allow us to accelerate some of our financial goals including paying off the debt for our North Katy campus so that we can move on to phase two, including some other specific financial endeavors that I think God has before us that could make a huge impact in our kingdom work around the community. And so we'll unpack those in the days ahead. All I'm asking for you to do now is pray with me that the Lord would show us how we might accelerate those financial goals together. And then we come to that last letter, P, L-E-A-P. How do we leap into the future? And that is this, that God would allow us to promote the disabled. The Lord has brought, we talk about it all the time, the nations to our doorstep. And so we have our international people groups ministry. But you know what? The Lord has continued to bring to our doorstep also families with those with special needs or disabilities. And I am so grateful for that. In fact, our church is teeming with wonderful families God has brought here with a unique challenge maybe in their household. And they add so much beauty and life to our congregation. But I'll tell you, we barely scratched the surface and we're finding that already, that the more we reach families with disabilities, the more the word gets out and, and the more demand there is an opportunity for us. And so we don't want to diminish that. We want to promote the cause of the disabled just as Jesus would if he were uh, conducting his earthly ministry right here in Katy. And so that means we recalibrate some of our priorities in that area. And we want to consider, pray, pray through some specific projects in the days ahead for both campuses related to our special needs ministry. And uh, I want you to know something personally, of course. I care deeply about this as your pastor, but also I'm one of these families. And so I've seen ministry through a little bit different lens because I've had the privilege of raising our 15 year old daughter, Lily, with, uh, with several disabilities that she faces on a day to day basis. And we know the challenges that these families face uh, specifically and personally. So would you pray with me about these? Remember, we have three goals in the coming year that we're praying toward together. And, and they're so significant. I can't even tell you how much it means that we can walk through these together. First of all, we must recognize the urgency of this moment. There are multiple challenges and opportunities that are coming soon. 
Second, we must reset the vision. As great as it is to see 10,000 homes transformed by the power of the gospel, when we recognize what's happening in our world, I think God will allow us to do even more than that. And third, we want to recommit collectively to the mission that God has put before us, that the Lord would allow us to see these habits lived out in every home that we serve. Would you pray with me toward these endeavors? I think God is up to something great in our midst, and I can't wait to see what he has in store. Hey, let's pray together, and then we'll return to our service. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege you've given us of being a part of this place at this time. And thank you for the men and women who've gone before us, who brought us to this place. But God, we recognize that there are things happening around us that only you can do. And that's what we're asking, God. We're asking, Lord, that you would use Kingsland and the households of Kingsland to do something that's beyond any of us, to do more than we can put in a spreadsheet or put in a plan. But Father, we are asking that we could see homes transformed around us. And in fact, that we could witness a revival of families in our lifetime as families turn back to the Lord and look to you. And because of that, our community is transformed and our nation is transformed and our world is transformed for your glory. God, would you do it? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Doesn't it fire you up to hear our senior pastor excited about what God has laid on his heart? You know, Pastor Ryan, he's been talking about uh, and, and leading our teams towards uh, this initiative for a couple of months now. We've been praying and just seeking the Lord on, on what he would have us do along these lines. And can I just tell you, it's a great privilege for me to follow uh, a man of, of God the, the great leader that, that Pastor Ryan is. And, and he doesn't pay me to tell you that. I'm just speaking that as, as your campus pastor, to have the privilege of, of following a man like him is an incredible for me. And so I want to pick up one of the things that he just mentioned uh, and, and just talk about it for a brief moment. For all of you men, January 20th, Thursday night at the Central Campus, that is a cannot miss event. I'm going to be there. Uh, Rush is going to be there. Uh, we hope to have hundreds of men from both campuses as we talk about our calling, our responsibility as the leaders of our household. And so I would ask that you would make plans right now to be there that night. But for all of us, we don't have to wait till the 20th. Starting this Wednesday night, Wednesday night activities are back right here at North Katy, and we have a brand new class for all adults. It is called Recharge, and we are digging into our hearts, and we're going to talk about how we can recharge our hearts, how we can recharge our homes, and we can recharge our community. No matter what your last few years have looked like, there's going to be something in this series that, that you are going to connect with. It's going to encourage you and challenge you and equip you uh, to take some steps forward in your relationship with Jesus. We have programming for all the kiddos and for every adult, and so I hope that you'll join us this Wednesday night. All right, that's the end of the infomercial. Um, as we close this morning, I want to call your attention back to our initial text. As we study Revelation and hopefully we get excited and we get motivated about the urgency of the time, about our King Jesus coming back to claim his church, it is vital that we remember that this book, that our lives is all about Jesus. You see, it's easy for us to get caught up in the drama, the symbols, the mystery, the debate in the book of Revelation and completely forget about its primary purpose. You see, it's all about Jesus. And we can look back just at those first two verses again and see it so clearly. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave John to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of who? Jesus Christ in whatever he saw. 
So as we study Revelation over the next couple months, we are doing so to learn more about the character and the person of Jesus and to grow deeper in our relationship with him. We aren't looking at this book to become experts on eschatology. We aren't looking at this book to to win a debate and to have more bullet points than the person that we're arguing with. We just want to know more about Jesus. And when we come to God's word humbly, asking his Holy Spirit to speak truth to us, we're going to grow in that relationship and understand more about that God who loves us more than anything in the world. Look at verse three, it says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near. Did you know that Revelation is the only book in the Bible that has that specific promise? That when you read it, you're gonna be blessed. And obviously when we open up the pages of scripture, that's something that happens, but this is the only place where that is specifically and expressly written to those of us who will read it. And it's crazy to me that this is the least read book by believers because God says, hey, if you want a blessing, you look right here at these words and expect what is to come. And the reason for that is because it is all about Jesus. I want you to think with me for just a moment about a wedding. You see, at a wedding, uh, there's this, this one person, it's, it's typically a woman, and she is called the wedding planner. She's the person that's involved in all of the details. She knows every part of the service. Uh, she knows what is to happen, who's involved, and she even has contingency plans for if something goes wrong, something goes off, something gets messed up. But also at the wedding, there's another party. It's the groom, this poor guy. He knows none of that. He he has no information about the important details of the day. He doesn't know what color the flowers are. He doesn't know who's coming. He doesn't know where people are gonna sit or even what he's supposed to wear. But what he does know is vital. He knows that the perfect woman for him, the love of his life, is going to be walking down that aisle at any moment to be his bride and so that they can start their lives together. He isn't concerned about any of those other details. He is fully consumed with the anticipation of that woman to come and be his bride. You know, I've known many people in my time in ministry who, when it comes to the Bible and specifically the book of Revelation, they're exactly like that wedding planner. They have their charts, their graphs, their facts and figures, all of their bullet points figured out, and it's all in their head. But their heart is not beating with anticipation for the one who is to come, the one who is the love of their life, the one who will change everything for them. I want you to know, friends, that our bridegroom is coming. And on that day he does, it is my hope and my prayer that we will all be like the groom in great anticipation of his arrival, ready for those doors to open. You see, we're not beginning this new year with a study to help you feel smarter about the cosmic calendar. We're beginning with a study that I pray is gonna impact your personal walk, your your daily relationship with Jesus, and it'll help you fall more in love with who he is and to anticipate that glorious day when he returns.